topic is extremely relevant right now and we have uh, you know the problem of the covid-19 is actually affecting many countries around the world and uh, you know so we have uh, more than 213 countries which are uh, affected by the uh, the covid-19 uh, and uh, this disease actually started from uh, wuhan in china but then you know it has actually uh, now uh, reached out to 213 countries around the world and uh, two uh, international carriers are also uh, you know the crew and the passengers are also infected so we have a, a very large number of people who are actually affected by the disaster and so what i have been asked to speak to you about uh, is about uh, disaster management in the context of covid-19 the potential for tech innovations i am very grateful to uh, madam aruna katara and also to dr rajesh and dr vaidehi for giving me this opportunity to interact on this topic because uh, iscore it uh, is actually one of the leading uh, information technology educational institutions uh, in pune and uh, as you've seen from the presentation introducing the institution they also have been in, involved with uh, uh, you know many research projects and consulting assignments and also uh, been uh, receiving the attention and the recognition from recruiters and some of the major uh, it companies have been recruiting the the students from i square it so this presentation is basically covering three aspects well, the first is to give a, a a brief overview on disaster management and the second part will actually look at uh, covid-19 the global national and state highlights and look at some of the critical gaps in preparedness and emergency response and uh, we will also be looking in the third part on the tech innovations in hardware software and convergence and road ahead and uh, we would also be looking at the, the need for preparedness uh, in the Uh, in the country in terms of you know the emerging threats and shocks so uh, what is a disaster in the disaster management act 2005 a disaster has been defined as a catastrophe a mishap a calamity or a grave occurrence in any area arising from natural or man made causes or by accident or negligence which results in substantial loss of life or human suffering or damage to and destruction of property or damage to or degradation of environment and is of such a nature or magnitude as to be beyond the coping capacity of the community of the affected area and this definition is a very comprehensive all pervading definition and so any disaster in terms of the kind of uh, various disaster typologies which we have uh, been facing Uh, gets covered under this broad definition and disaster management is a continuous and integrated process of planning organizing coordinating and implementing measures which are necessary or expedient for prevention of danger or threat of any disaster mitigation or reduction of risk of any disaster or its severity or consequences capacity building preparedness to deal with any disaster prompt response to any threatening disaster situation or disaster assessing the severity or magnitude of the threat of any disaster or sorry evacuation and rescue and relief rehabilitation and reconstruction these are the broad areas which are covered under the Uh, the process of disaster management and if you look at the phases of disaster management you know you can understand that there is a pre disaster phase and a post disaster phase the pre disaster phase is before the onset of the disaster and we have a sudden disaster occurrence and before the onset of the disaster we have two p's which the first p stands for preparedness and the second p stands for prevention or mitigation it's also called mitigation in the pre disaster phase and most of the advanced countries are very strong on the preparedness and prevention aspects and when a disaster happens in the post disaster phase we have three r's the first is response second is rehabilitation 
The third is recovery. So response, rehabilitation and recovery are the major phases of the post disaster phase. And in most of the advanced countries, they're very strong on the upper half, the pre disaster phase. So they're very strong on the preparedness and prevention. So when a disaster strikes, their response, rehabilitation and recovery is a very seamless process which does not really paralyze or over, over, um, overwhelm the whole economy and the society. Whereas in India and countries, many of the developing countries, we really need to strengthen our preparedness and prevention or mitigation. And that is one of the lessons also from the COVID-19. And that is why we are weak on the response, rehabilitation and recovery. We are really seeing the overwhelming aspects of the disaster of the COVID-19 disaster. Now, if you really look at uh, the disaster management as a continuum, you need to have a proactive strategy which looks at preparedness and prevention and mitigation through capacity building. And when a disaster strikes, you know, we respond, provide immediate relief, restore the disrupted facilities like, you know, electricity and power, power supply and also telecommunication facilities. And then, you know, if houses are damaged, you know, we reconstruct the damaged houses and also damaged infrastructure like bridges and hospitals and health center facilities. Uh, schools and buildings uh, in government offices and so on. And then we come to what is called a recovery. And so we have the uh, the early recovery phase and the and the, mm, the recovery, which is substantive and uh, you know also sustained recovery, which happens. The major disaster typologies include geological disasters like earthquakes, landslides and tsunami. The hydrometeorological disasters like floods, cyclones, cloudbursts, and drought. Technological disasters, mostly chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear emergencies. Epidemics, dengue, chikungunya, H1N1, H5N1, SARS, MERS, Ebola, Zika, and COVID-19. Uh, SARS is the South Asian Respiratory Syndrome. The MERS is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. These were earlier instances of the, the virus infections which are actually happening earlier. And COVID-19 is actually one of the versions and that's why it's called the, norm, the novel coronavirus because they feel that this is a new stream of uh, virus which is very virulent. And then we have the man-made disasters like terror attacks, riots, bomb blasts, forest fire, etc. We also have transportation accidents like road accidents, rail accidents, and boat capsizing and others. So there are many disaster typologies, but uh, we are now seeing the, sh the, um, the second generation effects of, uh, you know, cascading effects of several disasters happening simultaneously. We saw that when the COVID-19 is actually already uh, challenging and paralyzing the health facilities in many parts of the country, we saw the, uh, the cyclone Amphan coming and, and you know paralyzing Orissa and also West Bengal, the Sundarbans area, damaging infrastructure, uh, houses and facilities, and also many of the people who were first responders, including the National Disaster Response Force personnel, the police officers, and uh, the civil society representatives. Many of them who were responding to the cyclone were also uh, affected. And they were in, you know, uh, they were infected by the the coronavirus while they were actually doing the response. We find that some of the SDRF personnel uh, from Orissa who were actually responding in West Bengal to the cyclone relief and restoration facilities and support facilities were also now infected. And we have thousands of police uh, policemen in Mumbai affected. And so these are frontline workers, uh, doctors, nurses, and we had the unfortunate loss of life of some of the frontline workers, especially doctors and nurses. Now the national vision for disaster management, which was actually outlined by the National Disaster Management Authority, and which has also been outlined in the national policy, is to build a safe and disaster resilient India by developing a holistic, proactive, multi-disaster and technology driven strategy through a culture of prevention, mitigation, preparedness and effective response. And this is something which was actually discussed and finalized when we were uh, inducted into the National Disaster Management Authority in 2005 
after the devastating tsunami uh, of December 2004. And so from 2005 to 2010, I was at the National Disaster Management Authority uh, overseeing several aspects of preparing guidelines uh, for improving the disaster management preparedness and emergency response capacities. Some of the major disasters in India, which most of you are familiar with and most, most of you have seen on televisions and television channels and news reports and documents, the Union Carbide gas leak of 1984, the super cyclone of Orissa in 1999, the Gujarat earthquake of 2001, the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004, the Kashmir earthquake 2005, the Kosi floods in Bihar in 2008, the Kashmir floods in 2010, Sikkim earthquake in 2011, Cyclone Filin in Odisha in 2013, the Uttarakhand cloud burst and the flash floods in 2013, the Chennai floods in 2015, and the COVID-19 disease outbreak in 2020. And these are some of the major disasters which India has faced. Now, capacity building of disaster prone communities is extremely important. And this, I think COVID-19 has emphasized this, that we need to invest in behavior change communication. You know, if you look at uh, uh, the way in which people have been able to uh, uh, reduce the loss of life uh, and injury to people in, in car accidents is uh, by following this practice of wearing a seatbelt. So, you know, it has become a part of uh, normal behavior as soon as we enter the car and then we find that, you know, people you know, start wearing a seatbelt and that prevents uh, accidents. Uh, similarly, uh, wearing a helmet reduces the risk of, uh, you know, fatal accidents when uh, road accidents happen. So similarly, creating that cap capacity of communities is extremely important. And then wearing a mask has become important. Hand washing has become important. Using sanitizers has become important. Following physical distancing has become important in the COVID phase. So conducting mock, mock drills and exercises is extremely important. And then, you know, we have to invest in this. And you find that in Japan, the school children, right from their early years in school, you know, in the early childhood, they are exposed to the need for uh, drop, cover and hold because, you know, Japan is uh, prone to earthquakes and tsunami. So how to drop, cover and hold uh, and save yourself from uh, collapsed uh, buildings, uh, you know, in case of a, an earthquake. So you have to have mock drills and exercises which need to create the kind of preparedness and behavior change, uh, you know, in, in people to accept that anything can happen anytime, anywhere. So creating public awareness on disaster prone communities is important. So we have emergency operation centers, control rooms and facilities like that. However, the COVID-19 has actually become something which is uh, a disaster which has affected, as I said earlier, 215 countries and uh, more than, uh, you know, 7.2 million people have been affected all over the world. And uh, we have had, as per the last, last count, 4,10,837 uh, 4, 4, people, 10% of the people affected have lost their lives. And we have 90% of the people have recovered. Active cases are now about 3.2 million people in 215 countries around the world. In India, the coronavirus cases have become extremely alarming because we now have about 86,928 people affected and 8,105 people have lost their lives. We have uh, re reported a recovery rate uh, which is very high, it's about 52%, but uh, we find that actually 140, 1, 1, 1,40,651 people recovered is actually giving us some kind of a false sense of satisfaction because people have been declared to be recovered without proper testing. And after spending two weeks in the hospital, if they're feeling better, then they're declared as recovered and then they're actually sent back home which is actually not really a true recovery. And so we need to be aware that we have about 1,38,172 active cases in the country with uh, all the states and union territories affected. And in Maharashtra, we've had uh, 94,000 cases and 3,438 deaths and also a recovery 
almost 50 percent of 44,000 people. But then we know that this recovery is, should not give us any false sense of complacency because we need to be aware that there is a spread happening. And in Kerala, we have had more than 2,000 cases and 16 deaths. 848 people recovered and we still have 1232 active cases. So I think that we need to be aware that we have a lot of people who are actually possibly infected. And so we will come to this question of what is called the herd immunity uh, and whether India actually is actually having this community transmission because people who have declared community or uh, declared positive in uh, COVID-19 infected people are actually uh, interacting with people. They're, they're what are called primary contacts and secondary contacts are getting infected and people do not know who are the people who are infected. And so this is becoming very, very important. So this information that India is now uh, sixth in the world in terms of caseload and uh, moving up very fast because you can see that actually after US, Brazil, Russia, and UK and Spain. India is the sixth largest caseload country in the world, but uh, you know we are narrowing the gap between countries. In fact, a few days ago we were tenth in the world, and then you know we moved up very fast and then became sixth largest caseload country in the world, and we are very close to Spain. There have been reports that you know India has actually become the fifth largest caseload country, and uh, you know there's a very narrow gap. And then these numbers are actually misleading in many cases because you know we are not really sure whether these numbers actually tell the real story. And so we need to be extremely careful. And I would also like to emphasize one thing that you may have received several WhatsApp messages which say that you know India is much better because if you see these numbers of uh, uh, you know deaths per million people. Uh, I've seen many messages which keep saying that India has only six people per million deaths compared to 602 people in UK and 580 people in Spain. So we are actually doing much better. We should compare this to China, which has got three people, death of three people per million. We should look at uh, other countries and, you know, which like Pakistan also has 10 people per million and India is six per million. But this, I think, is something which we should not actually go by the figure of death per million and then compare and say that India is actually doing much better compared to UK and the US, including New York. That should not give us any false sense of, you know, self congratulatory, uh, you know, feeling that we are actually doing much better because we need to be aware that this is actually a life threatening disease and we have to be extremely careful. And in terms of the good practice examples of effective response, there are four T's which are important. The first is testing for COVID-19 infection and so that you know that some people are positive and then you start the treatment for them. So the first is testing. Second is treating the COVID-19 positive patients in institutional quarantine and home quarantine. The third is tracking the mobility of COVID-19 patients through geofencing so that you know that when the person actually goes out, uh, you know, uh, there's a possibility of, uh, you know, infection spreading, the disease outbreak happening. So you request people to stay at home. And in fact, we saw in Maharashtra and in many other parts of the country, uh, you know, they started putting um, the indelible ink stamps on the fist of the people saying that, you know, these are COVID-19 and so they should actually be in home quarantine and you know but these things actually are a question of behavior change communication because you have to be careful that you know you're not spreading this to the primary and secondary contacts even the people in your own families because this uh, tracking is important and then tracing the contacts of people who have uh, been in touch with uh, the covid affected people the primary and secondary contacts of COVID-19 positive patients is extremely important. And uh, what you're seeing on the right side is a, a whisk, which is a walk-in, uh, you know, screening kiosk where the, f the first responder, the doctor or the nurse or the paramedic or the, the lab pathologist sits behind a, a, a glass screen and then uses his rubber uh, gloves to test the samples without actually having physical contact with the patient. 
and this has been done in South Korea and then you know it was done in Kerala and then now it has come to a few states like uh, you know Karnataka and Telangana and Tamil Nadu and this is important and then you know we need to have more of testing um, in safe testing of COVID patients. Now here we are actually seeing the way in which some of the countries use the lockdown to basically make sure that you know people are able to contain the disease outbreak. In India, actually, our lockdown started on you know the 24th of March. It was announced that we will go through a countrywide lockdown when India had 519 cases and only nine deaths. But we saw that in the first lockdown during the period from 25th March to 14th April, we had 330 deaths. And in the second lockdown, we had 967 deaths. And now after the fifth lockdown, we have a large number, which is more than 8,000 deaths which have happened. So I think that we need to be aware that in the case of other countries, you know, you can see that the, the curve flattens because, you know, you see the curve rising, it reaches a peak and then starts falling. Whereas in India, actually, you know, we see that during the lockdown period, the 1, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 and 5.0, we've seen the curve rising so fast, actually. So we have not really been successful in using the lockdown as a, a, a strategy to really control the spread of the epidemic. We are still nowhere near the peak, and that is something which we have to be very, very worried about. We have the institutions like the National Disaster Management Authority, the National Crisis Management Committee, the National Executive Committee, headed by the Union Home Secretary, the Indian Council of Medical Research, the State Disaster Management Authority is headed by the State Chief Ministers and Lieutenant Governors, the state executive committees headed by the state chief secretaries, the district disaster management authorities headed by the district collectors, the national disaster response force battalions, the state disaster response force, and several institutions like the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Ministry of External Affairs, uh, you know, dealing with Indian nationals abroad who want to come back, Ministry of Civil Aviation helping the people to come back through the, uh, you know, uh, one day Bharat mission. Uh, by bringing people back in aircrafts and ships and also now the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, Ministry of Company Affairs and the Ministry of Railways and the first responder agencies like police, fire, emergency services, nurses, ward boys, security guards, etc. And these are all the institutions. And in fact, we need to have a single chain of command. And we've seen how cities like Mumbai and uh, you know Delhi and Chennai and uh, Ahmedabad have been facing really a very alarming situation. So in terms of the critical gaps in preparedness and emergency response, the countrywide lockdown for three weeks with four hours notice, we saw that when the trains were suspended, buses and all private transport were, were blocked from traveling. Uh, we saw the people, the migrant workers traveling across states, thousands of miles, and then, you know, some of them traveling, and then we had unfortunate loss of life of people on the roads, uh, through rail accidents and road accidents, and people were run over on railway tracks. We have had inadequate access to testing kits, PPEs, the, that is personal protective equipment, N95 masks, gloves, ICU beds, and ventilators. In Delhi, uh, for a population of uh, several crores, actually, you know, we only have 427 ventilators and you know how the, the people, the patients are suffering. There are not enough ICU beds. And yesterday, uh, you must have seen the Deputy Chief Minister of uh, Delhi mentioning that uh, in the next few weeks, we will actually be seeing the, the COVID cases in Delhi go up to 5.5 lakhs and we will be needing 81,000 beds. And right now, Delhi has about 8,600 beds. And you know, even if you say that 50% is being provided, if you need 81,000 beds, you know, you need to create that capacity. And I'm, I know that actually many institutions are providing facilities, including hostel facilities, hostel rooms, and all that are getting converted into beds uh, for, you know, uh, and you know, quarantine facilities uh, for supporting the physical infrastructure uh, for the healthcare facilities. We've seen flip-flop instructions issued by several nodal agencies. Uh, we do not see the ICMR in the picture. We do not see the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, you know, giving the instructions right now. We really see a, a lot of, you know, 
paralysis in the decision making. A request to state governments to arrange buses for the travel of migrants. Request for rapid testing, then pool testing, then RT-PCR testing, and the changing in the testing frequency to confirm infections. And now instructions to discharge patients without testing and to just push up the recovery rate. And the privacy issues in the Aruge Sedu app and the testing for the travel of migrants and so on. Now, on the right side, you are seeing that during the World War II, uh, many fighter planes were getting hit by anti aircraft guns. And fighter planes returning from missions were analyzed for bullet holes per square foot. And they found 1.93 bullet holes per square foot near the tail of the planes, whereas only 1.11 bullet holes per square foot close to the engine. Colonel Gaurav Bhatia gives this and mentions that, you know, we need to actually look at not just the uh, uh, the bullet holes, you know, and then yeah. recommend that, you know, you need to put the protective, uh, you know, uh, shield next to the tail of the plane uh, to save the plane because, uh, you know, this was actually mentioned uh, that one of the uh, one of the engineers mentioned that, you know, you you will have to put more protective shields uh, where the holes are not there because that is where we are only looking at the airplanes which uh, have returned, but the airplanes which got you know really uh, which were struck down and uh, you know where the airplanes which actually had got the maximum hits near the engine because that is you know we are looking at the engines of the we are looking at the aircrafts which have come back but we should actually be looking at the aircrafts which have fallen and to see how they fell because you know the engines were actually paralyzed and engines are not functioning so this is very important and i think you know we have to understand that Disaster management is something where you know you will need to use your intuition, you need to use your, uh, you know, compassion. You need to use your science and technology facilities, access to information technology, uh, scenario analysis, modeling, and so on. And we have the report from the Standard Workers Action Network after 32 days and still counting. Even now, actually, even even now, after 70, 78 or 80 days of uh, lockdown, we still have people stranded in different parts of the country. And, you know, the shramik trains have now been discontinued. We have been requesting for shramik coaches so that, you know, these migrant workers who are stranded can actually be able to go back home. And the impact of lockdown on migrant workers, we really do not have the data. And we do not have the data how many people are there who are migrant workers. We do not know how many people are there as informal workers. And the numbers keep changing. And even the Central Relief, Central Labor Commissioner in the Government of India did not have the numbers. And you know, Supreme Court had actually asked for the number of migrant laborers in the country, and they did not have the answer. And then the Central Labor Commissioner asked all the state governments to give the feedback on how many lab, migrant labor were there in the country within three days. And none of the state governments could actually provide that information. So we need to understand that, you know, this actually is something where the numbers are actually more than, you know, uh, 38 to 40 crores of the people are actually migrant workers. Now, this is something which we need to understand and we need to see that they, they have to be basically talking about it. Uh, This is just to show that actually, you know, in when you are unlocking the uh, lockdown, you know, when you are opening the economy, you know, people are actually going to be, uh, you know, desperately trying to see that their jobs are restored, they are able to get back to work, they receive their incomes because, you know, people, the migrant work workers, the wage, daily wage workers have lost their jobs for more than two months and uh, they have been, you know, suffering with loss of jobs, loss of income. And you know, so this needs to be provided. They need to be provided the support. So uh, the containing the COVID-19 disease outbreak, 
WHO mentioned that you know we need to test, test, and test, and early detection and early response. This is a mantra for containing an epidemic outbreak, and this has been mentioned by Larry Brilliant, a person who has written a book called Sometimes Brilliant, The Impossible Adventure of a Spiritual Seeker Who Helped to Conquer the Worst Disease in History. Larry Brilliant is a person who eradicated smallpox, and uh, there are several uh, videos which you will be able to see how he has been able to really control the uh, uh, an epidemic like uh, you know the smallpox. Now, in terms of the potential tech innovations for COVID-19, and since I Square IT has faculty members and uh, you know the the students are exposed to aspects in IT, uh, information technology, uh, computers, uh, telecommunication, and uh, electronics. We would need to understand some of the new uh, technical toolkits which can help in providing better preparedness for facing an, uh, any hazard, any disaster. Big data analytics, <coughs> use of artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, deep learning, embedded systems, augmented reality, virtual reality, mobile applications on smartphones, GIS enabled monitoring software applications for geofencing and so on. And these are these are just instances and these are just uh, you know various aspects which you know we will be able to see that. Now there is a lot of opportunity in terms of using the technology toolkits which are already available with I Square IT and uh, you know we will be able to come up with many solutions. So you have an incubation center where you have uh, you know, startup firms which uh, are able to look at many facilities. In fact, we also have uh, many calls right now. There is a Microsoft call for a $20 million grant uh, request for proposals for health issues. They are using AI for health. And uh, they have this AI for uh, health COVID grants from Microsoft. They launched this AI for Health as a $40 million five-year program to empower researchers and organizations with artificial intelligence to improve the health of the people and communities around the world. The program is underpinned with a strong foundation of privacy, security, and ethics, and was developed in collaboration with leading health experts who are driving important medical initiatives. Now, I think this is very important for us to know that companies like IBM have said that you know they will not use facial recognition software uh, especially because you know in large crowds like what is happening in the US protesters you know can we there's ethics involved in terms of you know looking at uh, uh, the privacy of individuals you know and the right of individuals to protest AI for health is the fifth Microsoft AI for good program a 165 million dollar initiative to empower researchers nonprofits and organizations with advanced technologies to help unlock solutions to the biggest challenges facing society today and they look at three key areas, quest for discovery, accelerating medical research, uh, then to advance prevention, diagnostics and uh, epidemics and diseases, global health insights to increase our shared understanding of mortality, morbidity and, uh, and preventing shocks. And the health equity, reducing the health inequity and improving access and care to the people, especially the vulnerable sections. Now, I would like to just conclude by just mentioning that COVID-19 is only the tip of the iceberg. Whether it, the COVID-19 is actually a bioterror or a bio error, you know, is something which we do not have the answers as yet. We do not know what is the role of the big pharma. We do not know what is the role of, uh, you know, countries which have actually look, looked at, you know, these kind of, uh, you know, epidemics. And you've seen Agent Orange, you've seen, you know, the anthrax, which is being used as a as a weapon. Uh, it will also challenge the public health emergency response capacities in all countries, and we must be prepared for several such threats. There'll be many waves of COVID-19 and all of us have to strengthen our immunity. People who are immune compromised and people with comorbidities have to be extremely careful. And this is actually also shown during the cyclone uh, Amphan. We have Srishti which is the Society for Research and Initiatives for Sustainable Technologies and Institutions. Uh, some of you may like to look at the, the GYAN network, the Grassroots Innovation Augmentation Network. And, uh, you know, Professor Anil Gupta, formerly with the Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad, 
has actually got this uh, our chalo avishkar kare you know to encourage students and youth to provide solutions and they have the honeybee network and you will see a large number of technical innovations which are possible and we would need to improve upon them adopt and adapt some of these things and you also have the birak and you know finally i would like to just mention that this is a, an opportunity for us for learning and unlearning and i'm very grateful to uh, you know i score it for giving me this opportunity to be here and to join you thank you thank you thank you sir thank you for the presentation um yes so so i have questions can i go ahead with the questions sure, now please. for you yes okay so the first question is uh, from rajesh where he asks what is the way forward for uh, you know in case of uh, covid 19 yes that is something which actually is a, a multi stakeholder engagement solution you know we oh need to God. have this we cannot leave this as something which is a responsibility of the government alone mm -hmm. you know all of us need to come together to find a solution because you know it's a society at large because a risk which actually happens because of somebody is spreading this uh, you know is a risk which can paralyze the entire society so okay. right now right now we are in the dangerous phase of community transmission you know mm -hmm. even, even though the the official declaration is yet to come the delhi government has been pushing for it and they say that for 50% of the cases in delhi they do not know how they got infected now this oh. is a worrying this is a very worrying factor you know oh, okay. you know all those people who are actually moving around now you see when the unlocking happened you know you see the markets open you see uh, you know people moving around in in buses which are crowded you know there's no physical distancing which is being maintained correct correct, it's correct. extremely dangerous so uh, i think correct. the road ahead is all of us to exercise extreme caution because this okay. is a this is a disease which is life threatening we have to be extremely careful so the road ahead is going to be solutions where we need to create that kind of awareness among ourselves uh, be careful about you know elderly people be careful about uh, palliative care patients uh, people who have uh, kidney dialysis or you know organ transplants correct or correct, correct. complaints or hypertension diabetes and many other uh, you know complaints Okay. So, so have you have you seen the peak of COVID-19, or is it yet to come? Not yet, actually. I think you know we have a long way to go. Oh my God! It looks as if you know we might actually be probably seeing this lingering on. There will be several waves. Mm -hmm. You know, we are still uh, we are still going to be waiting for maybe at least till uh, September. Uh, my assessment is that you know it will be at least till September. okay so is there is there any i mean before the lockdown happened did the government actually consult the ndma and other in government uh, in institutions as to how to do it or was it a, a decision that was taken obviously it was taken uh, very rapidly very fast but were they consulted were was the uh, agency consulted no i think that in most of these decisions actually uh, these decisions were largely influenced by political expediency okay you know okay. Uh, the announcement also was linked to the visit of the the president of the united states uh, you know mm -hmm. donald trump to visit india mm -hmm. and you know so that was one of the the deciding factors when the lockdown had to be announced after mm -hmm. this visit of the president and uh, you know so we actually uh, you know announced the lockdown much early and uh, you know we were not able to really uh, ramp up the hospital facilities as i mentioned okay. if, if delhi has only 427 ventilators and we do not know how many ventilators are there in a city like mumbai you know uh, we do not know how many beds are there now you see stadiums being converted into hospitals and you know Correct. covid health centers in pune okay. also palawadi sports complex uh, has been has been converted yes yes and yes, uh, yes. you know any other uh, you know amdabad and uh, patna and mumbai you know the uh, race course the mahalakshmi race course has been converted into a 600 bed hospital with 150 mm -hmm. icu beds correct, correct now these are all desperate measures you know we should correct. have actually used that period from 25th of march 
to really look at our own capacities, our own requirements. You know, we should have actually planned that. OK, so the next question is what policies should they should be have in place for <coughs> such kind of pandemic? Because like like you rightly said, COVID-19 is probably the first of its kind. So right. but we, which we were not prepared for. But for such kind of pandemics, what kind of policies should should organizations have? Should the government have um, right. so that you know we are protected at least? Yeah, actually, when we were in the National Disaster Management Authority from 2005 to 2010, uh, mm -hmm. several guidelines were issued <clears throat> and after consultations with some of the top experts in the country. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have uh, you know, national disaster management guidelines on the management of uh, chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear emergencies. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a guideline which has been prepared on the medical preparedness for mass casualty emergencies. Mm -hmm. now, these medical preparedness for mass casualty emergencies actually talked in terms of the need to look at uh, you know many aspects <clears throat> like how do you create uh, the surge capacity surge the surge capacity for our public health facilities mm -hmm. you know suppose there is a uh, there is a uh, a series of uh, bomb blasts which happen you know you, you know how do you create the capacity for okay. creating you know uh, these kind of facilities how do you ramp up the facility you know you can do that very fast you know, if you have the infrastructure, if you know the personnel, so you need to have all this. You need to have a directory of, uh, you know, a dossier of uh, professionals, anesthetists, mm -hmm. pulmonologists, uh, radiologists, you know, <clears throat> um, physicians, uh, surgeons, and you know, so on. So you need mm -hmm. to have that kind of, uh, you know, directory databases. You need to know how many blood banks are there, how many ambulances are there, available. how many ICU beds are there. And we need to really look at that. We need to have a disaster management plan which looks at that. We also okay. have a guideline on the uh, disposal of, uh, uh, you know, animal carcasses and disposal of dead bodies. Oh, yes. You know, yes. because uh, during the tsunami, we found that, you know, we were actually digging up uh, huge pits uh, using excavators. And then, so you know, people, yeah, yes. you know, we need to we need to yes. show dignity to the person who died, you know. OK, so the next question is, are we already, uh, do we have uh, <coughs> using any technology apart from the Arogya Setu app to control the pandemic? Is, is there anything else that is gone going from uh, right now? Uh, actually, there are many efforts which uh, many institutions are actually trying to look at. Uh, many state governments are developing applications which look at controlling the uh, disease outbreak. Uh, but there are issues like privacy which are involved. You know, you see that uh, uh, we keep hearing this message on the telephone that we are we are fighting a, a disease, not the, mm -hmm. the victim. Person, yeah, not the victim. Correct. We should correct. not stigmatize the victim. But we correct. have seen correct. that in places like Delhi. You know, we saw that uh, you know if you are a COVID-19 patient in a multi-story apartment, you know, you see uh, the the municipal corporation going around and then putting up boards saying that this person is a COVID-19 victim and the family Correct. should be preferred. You know, uh, doctors were boycotted, nurses were boycotted, yes. saw what was yes. happening. So I think as a yes. society, you know, we need to be much better prepared. Correct. We should the show next, the facts. Yes. OK, so the next question here is um, the person's name is not mentioned. Sir, there was a beautiful method which was adopted by the villagers in Kerala where each member had to carry an umbrella in order to maintain social distancing. Do you think it could be a way to combat COVID-19 using these measures? In fact, I think Kerala is one of the states who has managed to uh, control it uh, to a large extent. So yes, uh, about this. Right. In fact, actually, you must have seen the, uh, the pictures of uh, people putting uh, the physical distancing markers by putting their uh, you know, footwear yes. or their bags. And mm -hmm. then showing that you know they they reserve the place in a queue. Correct, uh, correct. Kerala came up with this thing of using a uh, an umbrella, and then you know people mm -hmm. hold the umbrella, and then you know you have distancing, which is actually marked yes. by the umbrella, so you yes. don't come yes. next to a person who's actually holding the umbrella. These are all yes. methods which people actually come in terms of looking at innovations, but uh, I think the most important is that you know we need to we need to show that uh, we wear a mask in public when you're actually moving out you know we need mm. to make sure that you know we do not actually go very near the person in fact uh, 
iscore it uh, in their incubator lab uh, you know one of the companies there one of the startup companies uh, prepared head shields yes, you know, face, yes. face shields in, and yes, face yes. shields and neeraj and his team you know yes. uh, fabricated these face shields and which are used by the, which are given to the policemen and i think these are important you know, these are innovations and you know we need to really create an awareness among people that these are important you know we need to protect mm -hmm. our people especially policemen auto rickshaw drivers bus correct, drivers correct. vegetable vendors and fruit vendors and so on correct okay so we have the next question from dr shweta sinha who's from thailand um, thank you for the excellent presentation would be interesting to know what kind of technology applications were used during cyclone amphan and do you grade the success of technology application in current disaster scenarios considering as a double disaster amphan and covid yeah that's a very good question in fact actually i think uh, we are really under utilizing the potential of technology mm -hmm. in many disasters in fact uh, you know uh, i square it has the the technology of uh, really looking at uh, the uh, the geomagnetic uh, you know uh, impact you know which can be monitored very carefully then you know you can also predict earthquakes in fact I, you know i was actually very happy to hear about uh, you know the efforts of uh, dr rajesh and his team to collaborate mm -hmm. on uh, looking at uh, predicting earthquakes you know, which is not okay. been done so far but then you know if you actually have access to information uh mm -hmm. i think it's very valuable that you know you can save lives by uh, looking at uh, you know how an earthquake can happen and you know if you are able to predict that by looking at uh, you know the geo technical geomagnetic uh, kind of uh, impact you know which you can actually anticipate it will be very useful in japan you know they try to uh, you know uh, stop the bullet train the shinkansen mm -hmm. uh, when an earthquake tremor mm -hmm. actually happens because you have the difference between the p wave and the s wave the primary wave and the secondary wave and a few seconds but within a few seconds you can actually save lives you know even a okay. few seconds become important you okay. know so i think technology can really help us a lot ai algorithms okay. can help us a lot in terms okay. of even understanding uh, you know gis enabled uh, you know uh, it solutions which can actually tell you how many people can become vulnerable if there is a storm surge you know how mm -hmm. many how many houses how many acres of land will get affected crop lands get damaged and so on if uh, okay. uh, you know a cyclone is about to make a landfall so these mm -hmm. are some of the ways by which you know evacuation is possible you could save lives but then i think covid-19 and the cyclone coming together created the problem because you know earlier you could put 2000 people in a cyclone shelter but now you know with the it's six so meter, you can it's very difficult yes. yeah, these are some of the okay. challenges Okay, so we have. Uh, I'll, I'll take one more question before I call on Aruna, ma'am. Uh, this question is from uh, Ravindra Joshi, sir. It's a two-part question which he has. First is that people are worried that COVID treatment in the government hospital is very poor, and it seems that many beds are vacant there. Is this true? This is the first part. And the second part is at the same time, it is published in newspapers that hospitals are full, and people are requested to go uh, go in for home quarantine. this is a complete contrast which of this is is the real truth <clears throat> you know this is actually i think a, a big dilemma a policy dilemma for you know most of the health administrators one mm -hmm. we do not really know what is the reality you know mm -hmm. we find that many people are actually using covid-19 for unscrupulous ways of making you know um, making a lot of money you know mm -hmm. some of the hospitals are charging 3 lakh rupees to even get a yes, bed yes, you know yes, so yes. in delhi the lieutenant governor and the, the you know has issued instructions um, the chief minister has now given instructions that uh, we should actually be having the number of beds displayed on a, a, a you know on a neon lit uh, board so that people mm -hmm. will actually have access to information how many beds mm -hmm. are there how many are occupied how many are vacant you know and so that you know people will actually have information right now many of the things which we are talking about we are not sure uh, you know because uh, people are ru running from hospital to hospital and we've seen the unfortunate pictures of uh, dead bodies in the wards oh, yeah. you know yes, next yes. to the patients now these yeah. these are things which are not acceptable you know these as a society we should actually be showing 
concern for human lives and this is very important yeah. okay so i think there are other questions but uh, since we have already reached uh, the time that we had scheduled i would like to uh, actually invite and uh, aruna ma'am who is the uh, aruna ma'am are you there can you join us yes um, aruna ma'am is here ma'am thank you thank you for joining us and aruna ma'am is the president of the hope foundation and research center and um, she would like to present her vote of thanks thank you sir thank you very much thank you, thank you is uh, just a very small word that we learned from the british area uh, we continue with sir ma'am and thank you but my thank you comes with a with a personal note to it if you recollect we met in my office a few months back yeah. and when you were regaling stories of how you started out with the disaster management system to bring it into india and successfully over the last so many years there are two things that struck me which i take the liberty to share if i may sir sure. what struck me is so the the knowledge and the depth and the understanding you had of the word disaster and what it means to raise to the occasion and to put together a team and respond to save lives the number of stories you shared in that short time that we met actually left me dumbstruck what left me more dumbstruck was really that here is this man uh, who has such a huge responsibility who has actually taken over a responsibility of being a founder member of the national disaster management this man here sitting sharing a cup of tea in my office is such a simple unassuming humble person with so much responsibility and ready to share all his knowledge thank you sir my thank you stems back to that afternoon we were very keen on calling you to campus for a further interaction with our students but covid spoiled our plans we decided let's not let wait for covid to get over let's just get you in because all the knowledge and all the background work that you are doing now and what you shared through your ppt and through your experiences today i am sure this has been an informative session for all of us so it would be fair to say that national disaster management in our country has grown from the nascent stage to a more mature place now in the last 10 to 12 years and that is because of people like you and your team uh, you have given us a overview of how to be prepared and be ready for any emergency response you have talked about how technology can support in the times of disaster management i am glad to know that at i square it we are actually working on technology which can be used in many areas of disaster management and as you shared preparedness is the whole trick so whether it is a pre disaster preparedness or a post disaster preparedness and you have shared the different ways in which we can all be uh, we can all understand what role individually and as institutions we can play towards disaster management you spoke about effective response whether it is when it is through testing treating tracking and tracing uh, many thoughts came to my head when you were saying that made me wonder are we are we at the herd mentality uh, stage am i saying it correctly the herd herd immunity stage uh, but you say that this is still far away and we have still not peaked and there are going to be many more waves so the message that i get and that all of us get is that we cannot afford to let our guard down and there will be several phases till september but we need to as a community and as responsible students do our duty to be able to help the disaster management team and all the health workers the frontline workers uh, to help contain the covid 19 i'm also very happy to know 
that you are aware of the face shield that our students had made on campus. These are actually mm -hmm. alum from FAMT and from I square IT, so okay. UG and UG, and uh, they have turned entrepreneurs on campus. So we have always been supporting our students and startups and entrepreneurs on campus. We have special facilities for them and Hope Foundation decided to support them by distributing a huge number of shields to the Pune police force and to many uh, doctors and hospitals. So with our own small efforts and with guidance and support from seniors like you in the field and our well-wishers, we look forward to a further association with you and your guidance so that we as citizens, each one of us can be on a track <coughs> doing some service to the nation. I understand a career and making money is important, but equally important is understanding the suffering of the fellow being. The plight of the migrants, the daily age workers, and the photographs that the media has shown us and what you showed us today is heartbreaking. And for all of us sitting in a room like this in urban India with the AC on and a laptop to work on, I think it is our duty our individual duty to come forward and in whichever way, whether serving a meal or serving food parcels, in any which way to help overcome the disaster the whole world has seen. And because our country is of such a large number, we have a bigger responsibility. So thank you, sir, again, and we look forward to your further guidance and interactions. Thank you very much.